morning. <laughs> well, okay, I'm on. Good morning again. And welcome to worship. Are you excited about Pastor Wayne's new series, Revival? Are you excited? I just got this, um, I get this feeling. I was talking to other people. We talked to Rudy about it. I talked to Dave about it. There's a number of people that have got this feeling that this series on Revival is going to be big. So I think we need to add this to our prayer list at home that, uh, that God will work in the hearts and minds of His people. I'm excited about this. Let's go through a few important things this morning. Pastor Wayne has put together a little handout that you can grab. It's titled, Learning the Lesson of 9-11 by Pastor Wayne DeGruy. It's kind of making sense of uh, when we have a 14-year anniversary of what happened, uh, the tragedy that happened on uh, 9-11 a few years ago. So feel free to take one of these as a stack of them at the, at the front counter as you grab one as you leave today. Next thing, we'll talk a little bit about Sunday school. This morning we have Sunday school for the younger kids of three to five-year-olds. And we've got Sunday school for the next group, which is 6 to 12-year-olds. And for the kids that are 13-year-olds and older, I am working on some material. I think I've got it narrowed down, and I hope to be purchasing something real soon. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have some Sunday school for the kids that are 13 and older. That'll go through high school and pretty much any age. We're old enough to that. Okay, next thing. Before you leave today, be sure to give... Be sure to give Pastor Wayne a, a hug and a kiss. <laughs> because, because you're not going to see him for a week. He's going to travel and see his mom and take care of some duties that she has for him to do. And uh, we wish him well. He will be back here next Sunday to preach. We're making sure of that. <laughs> but uh, just be sure to give him a, a nice little send off and wish him well. Pastor Wayne has planned um, a youth retreat for the fall. Uh, just starting to, to think about this, so we don't have the details, we don't have a date set. But what he's looking for is someone who might have a house or a cabin in northern Wisconsin that we could use. If you've got access to a house or a cabin in northern Wisconsin and you're willing to give this thing up for uh, a few days for a youth retreat, would you see Pastor Wayne and we can kind of start working on, on the date we can get this thing done? So we'll see Pastor Wayne if you're able to help with that. Is there anything else that uh, needs to be announced today? Anybody have anything? Next week, I'll, I'll have uh, some financial information so people can mm -hmm. see it. So. Next week? Yeah. Okay, you will like, look at that after the service maybe? Sure, we can do that. Okay. Okay, oh, some handouts. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you. Anything else? Let's stand and thank our God today. Father God, we're very excited. We're full of joy to be here to worship you. We're excited about the new series about revival. So we pray for revival in, in this church, in our community, in our nation, in our world, and in the hearts and minds of your people. We're looking for revival. So Father God, would you would you bless our pastor as he begins his series and he works on this? Would you would you bless your people? Father God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be here to fill this place, be in our hearts, bless us as we worship you here today. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our loving Savior, we pray. Amen. Would you greet each other this morning?
The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive a blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek his face, O God of Jacob. Let's worship the Lord.
Lord, we've just sung of your holiness. We've sung of your majesty. And how you and you alone are worthy of praise. God, when we come before you in your word and your truth, we acknowledge that we don't always lift you up and honor you as you deserve. We don't always remember that you see us in the night, in the darkness, in the solitude. You see everywhere we go, everything we do, you hear every thought. You know every word before it comes to our tongue. And Lord, we acknowledge to you that we forget that you are holy. For if we remember, Lord, we would humble ourselves before you. Lord, we pray that you would give us a thirst for you that is unquenchable. We ask that you would forgive us when we seek to fulfill the desires of our heart and things in this world instead of you. We pray that you would humble us as a people. We pray that you would teach us to pray. We pray that you would give us the strength to honor you day after day after day and never give up. We pray that we would seek your face, and specifically today as we come to you, we pray that you would help us to understand what seeking your face is from young to old. We pray that if we have been seeking the approval of other people or other things, seeking fulfillment and riches or in relationships or the favor of men, we pray that you would set us right today. We pray that we would hear your voice, that we would answer your call and be obedient to your word. We pray as a people that your Holy Spirit would speak to us as individuals, as families, and as a people. That we would respond to your words. That we would seek you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength to honor your name, to glorify your name. Lord, we are a people who are called by your name, Christians. We pray that we might live up to that name so that you would be glorified. And we pray that we would listen to you because you are our God. We ask that you would grow us in our relationship into greater levels of faithfulness. We pray that as you have loved us, that we would love one another. We pray that this would be exhibited in our homes and in our workplace. That when we're driving down the highway, <coughs> when we are listening to music, when we are opening our doors to people who come into our households, that they would know that we have declared our houses to be a place of refuge and a place of strength, a place where others can find you and a place where you are glorified. And where our hearts are not in alignment with you, we pray for a teachable spirit, that we would be righted that we would be restored, and that your name above all names would be glorified. We pray these things because we believe them in our heart, and we have a desire to live them with our lives. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all God's people agree and said, Amen. At this time, I would ask that you would prepare your hearts to bring an offering before the Lord. Today we're going to learn about the revival of our King Asa. Now, how many of you know about Asa very much in the Bible? Anyone? Know Asa very well? A couple of you. Uh, we probably know our current president about a lot more than we know Asa. Uh, so today we're going to learn about him. And one of the things that comes with the revival, the series that I'm preaching in right now, one of the things that comes when God's people are revived is a desire to bring sacrifices to him. It's one of the first things that happens. Our hearts overflow with joy and we want to honor God. So my prayer is that as we bring our offering before the Lord, that we do so with a joyful heart. Filled with the joy of knowing that our God is our God and that we are His people. Let's bring our offerings before Him in joy and gladness.
to see God's face, that you really want to know Him more. That you want to hear what He has to say. Because in truth, a lot of times in life, we don't. We don't want to see His face. We don't want to hear what God has to say. We just want to do what we want to do. And we can be quite content in that. And that's why we need revival. Because revival, in a very literal sense, is someone that has had life in Christ, and now deadness has set in, that must be revived. And the scriptures talk a lot about revival. And I want to begin with all of us having a biblical definition of what revival is. So I want to direct everyone's attention to that banner right there. And I want to read it together as a people. This is 2 Chronicles 7.14. And I want to challenge all of you to memorize this verse. Commit it to memory so that you can meditate on it and have the truth of it sink in and begin to live it out as a people. Let's read it together. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Can anybody say an amen to that? Amen. Man, do we need revival. We need revival in this land, but we need, need revival in the church, and we need revival in our house. We need revival. I've never met a Christian that didn't go through some period of stagnancy in their spiritual walk with Christ, ever. For, that, for a person to live with that fire in their life from the moment they receive Christ until death, they might be the thief on the cross that put his faith in Jesus and just died. I've walked alongside many believers, disciples, a lot of people, and when I have them grab their spiritual life, it goes all over the map. It has times like this, has times like this, times like this, and then times like that. And I don't know exactly where you are today. I pray you're like this. I'm pumped about this series. I'm excited. This week, I saw a lot of people get really excited about Green Bay. It's like, woohoo! They're, they're wearing their shirts, like a couple of you, and they're like, ready for the opening day, ready for GB. <coughs> Green Bay. Um, I'm excited about God of the Bible. If, if I'm excited about Green Bay, and I, I confess, I am, I'm looking forward to the game today. But you take that, and the God of the Bible, I'm Green Bay to the 10th power. I'm excited. Because when I read in God's word what he does amongst his people, when he brings revival, it is exciting. It's invigorating. It's life-giving. And the result of revival is absolutely awesome. I'm going to skip a little forward for you. Well, let's see. From your direction forward is this way, right? You start here and you go this way. I want to go forward a little bit. What happens when revival breaks out? When revival breaks out, when people humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways, God, who has distanced himself from the people because they rejected him and they're living life without him, God comes back in the spotlight and begins to bring about some things that they were missing. And one of the things that they're missing is vital worship. Vital worship happens. A vibrancy happens. A protection in the land happens. A fruitfulness among the people happens. A protection from your enemies happens. In other words, you get abundant life. And, and on the surface, when I ask, would you like mediocre or awesome? All of us would want awesome. And yet, many of us make the choice of mediocre or lame when we choose to distance ourselves from God. And let's make no mistake about it, it's a choice. So I, first, before I get into King Asa, I want us to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. 
Now, we don't use the word chronicle very often unless we're talking about like C.S. Lewis and Narnia or something like that. We, chronicle isn't one of these words in our common language, so I want to just tell you that a chronicler is a history writer. It might not be that exciting at the time, but if people don't record what happens, then we have a tendency to forget. So a chronicler writes down the interactions between God's people and God so that we can look back on history and learn from it. So we're going to learn from the chronicler. And this verse that we just recited from chapter 7 of the Chronicles, of 2 Chronicles 7, 14, I want to give you the context of this. Now, the temple has just been built, the very first one. Before this, they worshipped in God in the tent. And now they've got a temple that's built in Jerusalem. Solomon built it. It's absolutely gorgeous. And Solomon has this beautiful, beautiful prayer where he calls God's presence to be among the people. And God responds. And he says, I've heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. Now, as a church body, would you like God to choose to be with us? Would you? I want, this is important. A lot of people assemble without thinking about God being there. A lot of religious activities go on, and a lot of things can happen under the umbrella of being religious, and God's not in it at all. We know this especially in the scriptures where it says that there will come a time, there will come a day, when there will be a form of godliness, but there is no power in it at all. The form of godless Godliness is when people get together, they sing songs, and it looks like a fairly religious service, but God's not even there. So we want God there. And then God says in verse 13, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will hear their land. Period. Notice the beginning of verse 13. It says, when I shut up the heavens, when I cut off the rains, when I send the locusts, when I send the plagues, God is giving a forecast of days to come. And the forecast includes the times when God's people are going to turn themselves away from God and God is going to intervene. This helps us understand the nature of God. We know what to expect from our God. Our God is not a wild card. There's no mystery. God tells us right up front, if you choose to go away from me, I'm going to step away from you. He never leaves. He's not completely gone, but he steps back. God gives us what we desire. If we as a people of God desire to live life on our own and do our own thing, God steps back and says, you're adults. You're going to get what you get. And what you get is the removal of the hand of the blessing of God. Now, on the surface, we would say, who would ever choose this? But here's a fact. We are easily deceived as a people. And we, we quickly forget the blessings of God. And we do step away. And what God does, like a parent who loves their children, he will let some circumstances happen and intercede with some discipline to bring them back. He just doesn't let us go off into oblivion. He loves us. So he sends us difficulty so that we remember that we need God. How many of you have grown after a period of difficulty in your life, spiritually. Raise your hand. This is how God works. You step away, and you get disciplined, and, and like the prodigal son in the New Testament that Jesus talks about, there comes a time when we come to our senses and say, what in the world am I doing? God is so good. God has done so much for me. What am I thinking? 
God tells us in advance that this is how he's going to work. Verse 15, now my eyes will, my eyes, this is important about seeking God's face. What does it mean? What does it mean to seek God's face? To seek God's face, it means that you look up to him. You see his glory. You see the love that he has for you. And you want to be in approval. How many of you growing up have felt a time when your parents did not approve of how you were living? They turned their face away. It grieves them. Their, their, eye, their countenance goes down. You feel it in your heart. You see tears in their eyes. And it, and it twists your heart. Seeking God's face is a desire for your Father in heaven to give you approval. Well done, my faithful servant. You've done well in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Having your parents proud of you is sort of the feeling of seeking God's face. I want to be obedient. I want to honor God. So we, in verse 19 it says, but, but if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, I will uproot Israel from the land which I have given them. I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among the nations. As though this temple is now so imposing, all who pass by it will be appalled and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? The people will answer because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt. And they have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he has brought all this disaster on them. People will say, well, did God abandon the church? Did God abandon Israel? Who abandoned whom? They abandoned God. And how is a church to prosper when they abandon God and abandon His Word? There is no divine blessing. People look at it and they say, what happened to the people? What happened to this place? What happened to them? It's because they have forsaken God. Now, this is the word of God to Solomon. I want to fast forward several generations. Because when you fast forward several generations, see, Solomon sowed some seeds that grew up. And one of the things that he did is he, he forsook God in his relationships. God in his law says not to intermarry with unbelievers. And he intermarried with a bunch of them. And what he did for them, because they believed in other gods, he built them other altars. Now on the high hill of God, on Zion, he built a temple for Yahweh. But right across the way, right across the valley, he built another high place, a temple for the women of the other gods that he married. And, and it became sort of an ingrained thing amongst the people of Israel on high places. How many of you have ever heard the expression mountaintop experience? Raise your hand. Where's that come from? It comes from scriptures. Where did Moses go to meet God? He went up on the mountain. See, so we have this, this feeling that because God is high and above, that when we go up, we need Him. And that's true with religious people all around the world. So they go up on high places to worship, and they build altars on those high places to worship. One of the places that they would worship is under trees, because trees are higher than the ground. And when you go up under a tree, you're in shade, you're in protection, a symbol of divine sovereignty. So people would worship under trees, and they would build altars. So, fast forward, past Solomon's life, a couple kingdoms later, the land is riddled with altars at high places. And there's, there's a dependency on military might. There's a lot of divisions and war going on. 
They've made their own gods, it says in chapter 13. They've driven the priests out. They make their own priesthood. They consecrate the priests with their own authority. And they have made their own religious ceremonies with sacrificing bulls and having golden calves. Now, when I say golden calf, what do you think of? When the people were let out of Egypt, they worshipped the golden calf. So there's a resurgence of worship of the golden calf in these days, only a few generations away from Solomon. The land's not in the best of shape. Despite the fact that they still have some economic prosperity, they're not, they're not poor, they've got some wealth. Now enter King Asa, chapter 14 of 2 Chronicles. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. I want, to I want you to think of yourself here for a moment. Do you do good? Do you do right? Not in the eyes of people. What people say is good and right and righteous. Do you do good and right in the eyes of God? Because those are the only eyes that matter, by the way. And those are the eyes that see you when no one else is looking. They see you in the private places. They see you all the time. God's eyes. King Asa did. Now while he was doing this, what did he do? Verse 3. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. Now, I want to speak just briefly about this. When people worship other gods, they would carve stones. God's people were instructed never to make carved stones. When they made altars to the Lord, they made them out of rocks that were natural. Because God created those rocks the way that they were. When you put a chisel to a stone, you mark the stone with your own creativity, not God's. And you carve it into something that has some kind of image or shape. And people are prone to be drawn to that beauty instead of worshiping the beauty of the Creator who made it. We start worshiping the hands of the people that fashion it instead of God Himself. So there were these fashioned stones, these sacred stones. And people made these Asherah poles. For those that are older in the audience, an Asherah pole is a giant phallic symbol. They worship fertility gods. So part of the worship of these foreign gods had to do with the fertility of the land and the fertility of the people. And they would have, in these high places, imagine open orgies out in the open in these high places to worship these fertility gods. This is how far the people have fallen. I'll get into more about this idolatry and how idolatry impacts the people. Idolatry is always synonymous with the sexuality of people. So waywardness and sexuality has a strong parallel to idolatry. I'll get to that more later in the series. But Asa has declared war on these things. This is one of the first things that comes with revival. Get rid of the junk. Get rid of the stuff that's between you and God. Other things that are first in your life, things that you seek, desires of the flesh, get rid of them. Just be honest with yourself. How can you be close to God when you're worshiping these things? Is our sexuality a God in our culture today? Yes or no? Oh, my word. Absolutely, yes. Has it become a stumbling block amongst our culture? Yes. Has it become a stumbling block amongst our people in the church? Yes. Abuses are written in the press week after week after week. Barely a week goes by without hearing of it. Not just of believing people, but of the leaders, the pastors, the teachers. It's rampant. First place to start, sexuality, other gods. Verse 4, he commanded Judah to seek the Lord. He, he told all the people of the kingdom, seek the Lord. He redirected them. 
He didn't say, fall down and worship me. He didn't say, we're going to do it. He said, seek the Lord. That's the call to the people. Seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to obey His laws and commandments. This is the, one of the first things that you do. You differentiate the difference between God's commands and laws and man's. And you stick to it. Now, Vern announced that I'm planning a retreat for the young people. That's middle school and high school together, the retreat that I'm working on. The, the retreat focus is, is already selected, and it's, it's dare to stand. Do you dare to stand? Many times we don't. If you don't set your mind to seek God's face, when you're tempted, whether it's by peers or other things, you don't stand up for what you believe. You just get tipped over and you fall. So that the focus of our fall retreat is that we, as God's people, and don't let people despise you because of your youth. It doesn't matter how, remember David and Goliath? It doesn't matter how young you are. You can take a stand for God. We're going to study one of the revivals that takes place from Josiah, one of the youngest kings of Israel ever, that leads one of the greatest revivals in Israel history. We're going to study that later. Do you dare to stand on his word? So he goes through and he removes the high places and the incense altars in every town. So he, he goes throughout the towns and cities. And that's one of the things he does. Another thing he does, he builds up the defenses of the land. Do countries have enemies? Mm -hmm. Do churches have enemies? Mm -hmm. Build up the walls. You hear about that in politics. Let's build a wall, right? There's nothing new about building walls. As long as there have been cities, there have been built walls to protect. I want to share with you a problem. I want you to listen closely. A city that has been breached and has no walls is like a man who has not consecrated his heart to the Lord. You're a sitting duck. Do you have walls? Have you set boundaries in your hearts, men, women? Have you set boundaries in your hearts so that you're not a pushover to the devil? Some of us are not even fortified. We have no protection around us. God's word is not valued enough in our life or in our household where anything the devil tempts us to do, we are sitting up. We're a pushover. Because we've not sought God's face. We've not consecrated ourselves to him. We've not devoted our life to God. And as a result, we're in enemy territory all the time. And he just has his way with us. And I have to say there's a lot of believers that fall into this category. There's no fortifications. It's like a city that has been breached and the walls have not been rebuilt. And any time an enemy wants to come in, they just step over, they step over one brick. And they have victory. So these are some of the things. Then he raises up a strong army. He, he rebuilds the army. There's a great, in this Reformation period, they remember what God says. They begin doing it. They build up the army. They make fortified cities. And they say, we are the people of God. Now note that they don't go out on conquest to conquer the world militarily. This is for protection. All of our households should have this kind of divine protection. Verse 9 talks about Zerah, the Cushite. Now, anyone know where Cush is? Higher Bible maps. Cush is Ethiopia. Ethiopia, Libya area. And, and Zira is this, this very powerful military that came up out of Ethiopia and Libya up towards the Promised Land. Does that sound a little bit familiar? It still happens today. Vast army, 300 chariots. Asa went out to meet him, took up battle positions in the valley of Zephatha, near Marishah. So there's this big battle going to ensue. Listen closely to verse 11. Are you listening? Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there's no, no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we reply on you. And in your name we've come against this vast army. O Lord, you are our God. 
Do not let man prevail against you. Now, this is, he's not saying that God be on our side. He's saying we are on your side. We put our trust in you. You are the powerful one. We're lining up behind you. Now, you, this might sound a little bit familiar if you know the story of David and Goliath. David's going up an enemy that's ten times bigger than he is. He's got better weapons. He's got more power. He's got more victories under his belt. And what does David go with? A little stone that he picked up out of the throat. What was the key to victory? He, he ran towards the battle line. And he said, you come against me with sword and spear and shield. But I come against you in the name of the living God, who you have defied. In other words, when you come against God's people, you come against the living God. Prepare to <coughs> This day, the Lord will deliver you into the hands of Israel. Power, a young man, who is willing to take faith in God and led his whole people to a great victory. And in this day, Asa was facing a huge army that was coming against him. Do you ever feel outnumbered? Young believers? Go to University of Wisconsin. Go to almost any university. You'll be outnumbered by people who are godless versus those that honor God. I guarantee it. I went to a school that was founded by the Methodist Church, and one would never know it, because the entire time I was there, I never had a professor that was a Christian, not a single one. So you're going to the university. Many of you go to work, and when you go to work, you are outnumbered. There are more that honor the things of this world that honor God. And you step into that territory and I implore you to call upon the name of the Lord who is your God to fight your battles for it. Because you're not going to win on your own strength. It's only in the Lord's strength that we're able to stand. And Asa recognizes this. He calls upon God's help. And God routes the enemy. I'll give you just the footnote version. The other enemy is absolutely obliterated because God did it. Pretty awesome. And the whole army comes back, and they, instead of taking that territory, they come back to their place of refuge, and there's a huge celebration of, woo, you know, ticker tape parades, it's really awesome. And instead of praising themselves, they give honor and glory to God, which, good step, good step, good step. Everyone's excited. And the prophet Azariah stands up, beginning of chapter 15. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Odin. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, which is encompassed the entire southern kingdom. The Lord is with you. When you are with him. He didn't say the Lord is with you, period. He said the Lord is with you when you're with him. It's a reminder of Joshua's speech. And he said, choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God's with you when you're with him. If you seek him, he will be found. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, it, it talks about, then he goes into a history lesson of how God has delivered the people in the past, how when they fall away, that they get into trouble. He's basically giving them a history lesson of the period of the judges. If you know anything about that period, they would live for a while for God, and God would bless them, and then they would go away, and they'd fall into judgment. It happened over and over and over again. And make no mistake about this, God's character has never changed. He loves his children. When they start to go wayward, things aren't going to go all right because he wants you back. And this is the history lesson. So he says, learn your history. 
And he says that one nation was being crushed by another, one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. Now, all of us will face tests and trials. So here's the question. Do you want to face them with God or without God? Answer? What? With God. Me too. I don't want to face trials without God. Because when I face trials without God, I am crushed. By the way, when you're crushed, are you high or are you low? You're low. And that's where revival always starts. Low. Humble yourselves, it says. You get low. God will make you low, or you can choose to be low to start. If you're low, he will raise you up. If you're high, he will crush you down. Then Asa takes courage. Now, the prophet says this in verse 7, But as for you, be strong, do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Be strong, don't give up. Be strong, don't give up. They just had a huge victory. This is a foretaste of what's coming. There's going to be some more battles. Be strong. Don't give up. I know people that have given up. I know people that were once strong and are now weak. And I'm calling out to you today, be strong. Do not give up. Keep in it. If you're walking in the blessing of the Lord, stay there. Don't choose to go off by yourself. Separate yourself from fellowship with other believers. Separate yourself from a place where you grow, studying with people that hold you accountable. Don't stop that. Stay strong. Don't give up, for your work will be rewarded. Now, Asa heard this. He took courage. And in the moment, there's a revival that broke out in the land. And it was great. There was great worship. There were sacrifices. It was awesome. For a while. In fact, he took one step that was extremely amazing, and I want to point it out to you. He continued to go out through the land, get rid of the rest of the idols, all that kind of stuff. And then he confronted someone in his own house. This is hard. Verse 16. King Asa also deposed his grandmother from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive Asherah pole. He cut down the pole, he broke it up, and burned it. He just didn't take a, a passive swing at it. He broke it, he smashed it, and he burned it. They couldn't put it back up. It was in pieces and it was burnt to ash. There's no way they're going to put this thing back up in his day. Sometimes it's easy to identify godlessness outside your own house. We, we think, well, it's difficult to confront people in our own household, our own family members. He deposed his own grandmother, took her off from her high position, and said, you are out. Wow. Cleaning your own house. Application for the day. Clean your house. It's extremely easy, especially in our day, to point the evils of culture. The stuff out there. Them people. Those people that do that thing. And we can find a lot of other people that agree with us about them people, whatever category that sinful nature would be. But cleaning your own house, that's another matter entirely. Jesus talked about this at length. And he, he talked about judging in this respect. He doesn't say stop discerning. He says when you judge, don't fail to judge yourself. Be harsh on yourself. Look at your own house. Clean it up. Look in the mirror. Deal with it. Dealing with sin in family is hard. But it's good. 
I want to tell you a little bit about Asa's last days. Because Asa has great leadership, and his, he was trending up, trending up, trending up. They had a great economy, they had a strong army, the walls were built up, the house of the Lord was full of praise. And several years later, a new enemy rose its ugly head, and the enemy this time was the northern kingdom of Israel. At this point in the kingdom, it had already split. There had been a civil war and a division between the northern kingdom and the south. And the northern kingdom was uh, an enemy, brother against brother. And you see, there's a number of people from these tribes that when the revival broke out in the southern kingdom, they crossed the border, they came. When revival breaks out the people, and people see God, and people who seek God, they'll come and join you because they want to worship God too. God pulls them to you. But the satanic rooted envy and hatred will be stirred up. And what happens is the northern kingdom is amassing an army to invade. And Asa does something that he didn't before. He sends an emissary with a bunch of gold to another king. To another foreign power. The king of modern Syria. And he says, and he, he pays off that king with the treasury from the temple. He takes God's money, he robs God's treasury, and he gets into an alliance with a king who worships other gods. And then he says, if we band together, then the northern kingdom of Israel will be thwarted. And it works for a time. I, I couldn't help by studying this week, thinking back of, of when the United States of America via the CIA was funding a gentleman named Osama bin Laden. Because we had a common enemy, Russia. So we're providing Stinger missiles to Osama bin Laden and providing weapons and fortifications for a person who worships another god. And we build him up, we turn him into something that we didn't anticipate, the next thing, you know, he's attacking us. This is exactly what happened in the days of Asa. When he called for the king of Syria for help, and paid him off, he gave a signal of weakness of himself. I need your help because I am weak. And it came back on the people. Are you a student of history? I hope you are. Because if you're not, you have to learn those lessons all over again. And so he made an alliance with worldly knowledge that says the enemy of my enemy is my friend. We've made this mistake as a nation a number of times. As a people, we, we allied with Russia during World War II and kept that alliance after World War II that brought us into the Cold War period. And more people were killed by that regime than Hitler. But we started as partners. Now we continue to learn the same lessons over and over again. As we sign treaties with nations that have identified us as the great Satan. I want to take it home. It's a national. Take it home. Make it personal. Deal with evil alliances. Cut them off. Don't depend on other things to protect you. Don't depend on those things to provide soul satisfaction, money, possessions, entertainments, wealth, security, health. Asa made three different mistakes in his last days. One, he made this evil alliance. When he made the evil alliance, God raised up a prophet to speak to him. And that prophet comes to him. His name is Hanani. And he comes to King Asa. And he says, because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord, the army of the great king Aram has escaped from your hand. 
In other words, you were supposed to have victory over him, and now he's got victory over you. And oftentimes, when you set your face against God, when God's word is spoken to you, you cannot hear it. So what does he do? He takes the prophet and he throws him in jail. Didn't want to hear it. So first he made an evil alliance. He's drifting far from God and God says, hey, listen, you're making a mistake. And you're going to pay the consequences. He didn't like the message. He put him in jail. Second mistake, not listening to the word of God where you used to. Not only that, there are a number of people that aligned with the prophet and agreed with him so that the king would hear it. He persecuted them too. He oppressed the people as well. When some of the people were obedient, listening to God, it's like, you be quiet, I'm the one in authority here, you do what I say, you are out. So he took the people out of power that were speaking the truth. So stubbornly, he did not listen to the messenger of God. He had an unteachable spirit. And then it says the events of Asa's reign from beginning to end, verse 11 of chapter 16, are written in the book of the kings of Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. This is his third mistake. Now, sometimes we take modern day context and we place it back into that day, and as a result of that, we miss what God is saying. When he sought physicians for the disease of the feet, he was seeking people of the magic arts, not medical doctors like you and I have, where we go and we have someone examine our feet. Oh, by the way, there's a lot of symbolism in the scriptures. Disease of the feet doesn't mean that his feet were crippled. Doesn't mean that he had arthritis in his last days. Disease of the feet is a symbolic way to say that his feet had gone wayward. Anybody ever hear the country song? Whose boots have these shoes been under? Something like that. Oh, what is that country song? Whose bed have these boots been under? Okay? This is a symbol of Asa sleeping around. Disease of the feet. Your feet took you into the spot where you weren't supposed to be. And now we've caught a disease that's taking his life. Likely syphilis. This man's dying of a sexually transmitted disease. Now, early in his career, he's cutting down the Asher poles and he's getting rid of the idols, but in his last days, after God brought peace and prosperity in the land, he's forgotten God and he's doing the wayward stuff himself. The man that used to clean house now has a dirty house. Instead of seeking God, he's seeking other cures from the magic arts. You know why? Because when you go wayward away from God, it takes humility to go back to him to ask for help, and he wasn't humbling himself. This is how Asa dies. He dies in his disease and shame after he's walked away from the Lord and done all this awesome stuff. How would you like to be remembered in posterity? Your children and grandchildren, it's not just how you start, it's how you finish. Listen to the words of the prophet as he says to them, but as for you, be strong. Don't give up. I see a lot of people start well. Sometimes when life gets a little cushy, we sit in the couch because God has blessed us with prosperity and health. We get lazy in our faith and we end up going adrift. Sometimes that happens with stages of life. You get retired and you think, okay, I've done my job. I've heard this. Point blank. People ask to serve in various capacities or to develop other believers. And they say, well, I, I've done my time. Done your time? What are you, in prison? 
Are you a prisoner of the Lord that you only serve him when you're a certain age and then the rest of it's your time? Really? I've seen this amongst young people who have a fire for the Lord while they're in high school and they go off to college like, now it's my time. And they go adrift. And, go, and I've seen it with young couples. They say, well, I'll get serious about my relationship with God after I have kids. Take warning. Take heed. The principle of man reaping what he sows is throughout Scripture. You sow seeds to evil. And that's the kind of plant and fruit you're going to get back. Asa learned both the faithfulness and blessing of God and the judgment of God in the same lifetime. My prayer for us as God's people is that for you and your household and for us as brothers and sisters in this fellowship that we would experience only the former. That we would take courage and we would keep at it until we see Jesus face to face. Amen. Please join me. Lord, the Holy Spirit came upon your prophet and he spoke your word. And some heard it and listened and others did not. There were some that saw your face and there are others that in the light of your face could not bear the light and went to the darkness. Today we ask your favor, O oh God, that as a people that you would humble us, that you would give us a strong desire to serve you and you alone. That your spirit under conviction would lead us to get rid of the things that are between us and you. To clean house, to get rid of it. To cut it down, to smash it up, to burn it, to get rid of it. Lord, we know the things that are between us and you. It's not a mystery to us. We feel your spirit's conviction. We pray that you would help us to follow through with that which we are convicted. So that we might honor you with pure hearts and clean lips. That we would serve you with clean hands. God, we pray that you do a wonderful work amongst us. That we would devote ourselves to seek your face. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The character of God never changes. Old Testament, New Testament. I hear some people that when they talk about God, they talk about the Old Testament God. Well, let, let me fill you in. The Old Testament God is the New Testament God. It's the same God. Some of you know Dr. Walter Kaiser, a dear friend of mine. I heard him one time exposit a text from the New Testament. Someone said, so, you like the New Testament too? And he said, yeah, it reminds me a lot of the old. <laughs> Jesus, when he was teaching his people about worries, said, seek ye first the kingdom of God <coughs> and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. What things? Are the things that we need in this life. Protection, Clothing, food. Our battleground is on every front, every test. Who do you trust? Putting your trust in the financial markets? Where do you put your trust? Putting your trust in other people for soul satisfaction? Putting your trust in things? Putting your trust in abilities? Put your trust in God. Let's close our service by singing, Seek you first. And... Let's pray as we sing. Let's stand together. In number 42, if you have to look it up. Actually, not secret. That was the right now. Yeah, it's in number 42. In number 42. You don't even have to look it up. Seek you first, King of God, and His righteousness, and all these things made unto you. Second verse, ask and it shall be given to you, seeing you shall find.
my body you knows my heart. Let's sing it.
Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.